So, Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 7 through 12. Galatians chapter 5, uh, reading verses 7 through 12. Here's what Paul says. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. What we have here is very strong language from the Apostle Paul. And the strong language is because last week in verses 1 through 6, Paul's focus was on false doctrine. That's false teaching. And here we are in verses 7 through 12, and Paul's focus is on the false teachers, the ones who are propagating the false doctrine. We can see from this very strong language that Paul is very serious about this matter. And the seriousness of the matter centers on God's word. It centers on the fact that Paul values more than anything else in his life the integrity of the word of God. And when people start messing with the gospel message, Paul is taking it personally. I think he feels that they're they're messing with God's word, they're messing with God, and, and they're messing with his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary's tree. And Paul was not going to stand for it. Now, he uses an illustration. He starts off with a phrase in the very beginning. He says, you were running well. So as Christians in this life, we are in a race in which we must all run well. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. To win the race, the runner must start well and finish well. What happens in between the races start and finish is what defines the Christian's life. We run this race because we have been saved and we want to fulfill the will of God in our lives. In verses 1 through 6, like I said, Paul's focus was on false doctrine, false teaching, and now here we are in verses 7 through 12, and his focus is on the false teachers themselves. We have three areas of focus for today, and we want to understand these three things. Number one, the dangers of false teachers. Number two, the consequences for false teachers. And we want to understand how to guard against false teachers. So let's take, first of all, Focusing on verses 7, 8, 9, and 11, let's focus on the dangers of false teachers. Verse 7, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Danger number one. There are several dangers that I want to highlight, actually four, several dangers. Danger number one, the dangers of false teachers, found here in verse 7, false teachers hinder people from obeying the truth the truth. False teachers hinder people from obeying the truth. Listen to the literal, a literal translation of verse 7. You were running well. Who cut in on you so that you stopped obeying the truth? Who cut in on you? You see, this is a, an illustration that Paul's readers would have understood. The Olympic Games happened annually, just as they still happen every four years here in the 21st century, his readers would have understood the illustration of running a race. The Galatians' stride in their spiritual race had been broken. To run a race well, you have to hit upon a stride. And as you hit upon that stride, you maintain that stride. And when that stride is broken, you are diverted from the line that you have set for yourself in running that race. Paul knows that certain people, false teachers, 
Judaizers, have cut into the Galatians' running lane, and they are spiritually detoured. The Judaizers were the false teachers who were doing the hindering. He says, he asked the question, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Listen, being a hindrance to the gospel is a felony crime. It is serious business. And Paul wants to know, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, obeying the truth, there are a couple of things to observe from that phrase. There are really two responses. Obeying the truth includes two responses. Unto salvation is response number one. One's response to the gospel in salvation is obeying the truth. And number two, in sanctification, one's response to obey God's word in their daily living is obeying the truth. Paul wants to know of these Galatian, believe, Galatian believers who have been saved, who is hindering you from your growth? Who is hindering you from obeying daily God's truth? Who is that? Who's responsible for this? There were two effects of the Judaizers upon the Galatians. The Judaizers were responsible for hindering the unsaved from responding in faith to the gospel the gospel's effectual call unto salvation, and the, the Judaizers were responsible for hindering believers from living their lives in God's grace by faith. So if I could summarize here, danger number one, danger number one, which is that false teachers hinder people from obeying the truth. False teachers hinder the truth. What's the application? See it. See it. Have radar for it. But the only way you can detect the error is if you know God's word. You can't detect the error if you don't know God's word. So know God's word. How do you know God's word? Study it. Examine it. Know it. Or you're going to be knocked out of your running lane, just as the Judaizers were, because you don't know the truth enough to be able to, de to discern the truth from the error. That's the lesson for us here. False teachers hinder people from obeying the truth. Another danger of false teachers, danger number two, false teachers, according to verse eight, do not represent God. In their teaching, they do not represent God. Verse eight, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. Paul says it like it is. What you are hearing, what you are entertaining, it doesn't come from God above. And if it doesn't come from God above, there's only one other place where that comes from. It's from Satan below. So what is this persuasion? What does he mean by that? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. We know that the Judaizers were teaching a hybrid gospel. Their message was faith, yes, plus works. Faith plus works is what gets you favor with God, and that's what is going to earn you your salvation. That's this persuasion. Paul is saying the message of these people is not from God. Their message is not God's message. It's convoluted. It's wrong. And he said it is another gospel. Not that there is another gospel. It's another gospel. He already made the point that their persuasion is anathema, damned, accursed. And then he repeated it. I'll say it again. It's anathema. It's cursed. It's damned. So Paul is very serious here. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. If someone preaches or teaches something contrary to the word of God, know that that message is not of God. He who propagates a false message is either preaching or teaching in ignorance or in willful disobedience to the truth that they know. Whatever the case, though, it's dangerous. And what does Paul say? Stay away. 
Don't entertain it. Don't give a listening ear. We'll get to that in a minute. Another danger of false teachers, number three, danger number three, false teachers are a contaminant in the body. False teachers are a contaminant in the body. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul now goes from running to baking. From running to baking. What does Paul have to know? About, what does he have to say about baking? Well, Paul knew enough to be able to use it as an illustration. So listen up. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Verse 9, he is going to use leaven or yeast, yeast, in order to make his point about what? The power of sin to contaminate. Scripture uses this reference many times over. In fact, if we look historically at the Jewish people, uh, leaven or, or yeast was, was to be kept out of the home uh, during their feast celebrations, especially Passover, because it was representative of sin which contaminates. So, here we have yeast, and Paul is showing us a good illustration of sin. It's small. But if left alone, it grows and it permeates the whole. One of my favorite things that Cindy makes from her Brazilian culture is pão doce. And pão doce is sweet bread. And she starts it from scratch with the flour and water, and then she, she gets that all, she mixes in the yeast, and, and when the yeast is mixed in, just a little packet, maybe not even the whole packet, I don't know, because I'm not a baker. I just eat what she bakes. That little bit of yeast for that big dough ball is, is going to make it rise and it's going to make it grow. And that illustrates the impact of sin. Sin, like yeast, just a little bit, can infect and permeate the whole. And it's very, very impactful. The false doctrine of the Judaizers was introduced to the Galatian churches in a very small way. But before long, that yeast grew, and eventually it took over the way it does in that dough ball when we put it in to bake, and, and it rises to become the bread. So to summarize, false teaching. Listen, here's, here's one lesson that I see here. False teaching does not necessarily suddenly explode upon a congregation of people. It's like yeast. It's a little bit introduced but before long, it's gaining momentum, it's gaining traction, and then before long, it's spreading. And as it spreads, it infects the body. As believers in Jesus Christ, here's my question for you. Do we share the same zeal as Paul in defending against false teaching? You can see he's using the, the runner illustration, the yeast illustration, Paul is, is, uses very strong language in verse 12. And my question for us is, are your antennae up? Do you know the word well enough to detect the error when it's presented? Some subtle ways in which it happens. Can you, do the antennae go up and do you say, mm, I'm not sure that stacks up against God's word. Are you able to do that is my question. Because if you can't, you need to get into God's word so that you can because that's how we are going to protect the integrity of God's word. And that really, brothers and sisters, is the Christian life, is growing in our, not just our head knowledge, but growing in our head knowledge, but growing in a relationship with Jesus Christ, which only comes as we invite the Holy Spirit through our obedient living before him. Know the word so that you can defend it. Know the word so that you can see the error when it presents itself to you. The past 18 months have been eye-opening. As I believe that the politics of a lot that's going on in our country, which seems to be driven by people's perspective, and I understand that in the body of Jesus Christ, we land on both sides of this issue concerning COVID-19 and a response to it. But I feel like as people try to navigate this, and this is just one example of how we navigate difficult situations in our lives, I have a question for you. I have a question. Are you allowing your politics to drive your theology, or does your theology drive your politics? 
I'm seeing a lot of people who equate con politics on whatever side of that equation, they equate it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because they feel strongly about a political position, they equate that with the gospel and they're very fervent about that. But my question is, do you know the word of God and can you defend it? And if you know the word of God and you can defend it, that is what is going to drive your response to any situation in life, including politics. Do you see what I'm driving at? So I believe in the centrality of God's word and that informs our living. It informs our living. Danger number four. Danger number four. False teachers tend to be incensed by the truth. False teachers tend to be incensed by the truth. Verse 11, but if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Here's the, the backstory, very briefly. Though Saul the Pharisee had preached circumcision, even justification by the law, as a Pharisee, as an apostle, he never preached circumcision for salvation. Never. Because that would make him a hypocrite. And so he asked, to paraphrase, I am not preaching circumcision. Why are you still persecuting me? I'm not preaching the law that justifies. Why are you persecuting me then? Why? These false teachers did what false teachers do. They attack the messenger. They attack the messenger. They hate the message. They don't like the message, so they attack the messenger. Look at what he says to conclude in verse 11. In that case, the offense of the cross has been... But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Now, the word offense here from the Greek... It means stumbling block. The cross is offensive to unbelievers because they cannot accept that they don't contribute to their salvation. That's the stumbling block of the cross. You see, it's all about Jesus Christ. We can't merit our own salvation. And when man has to come to grips with the fact that strong man can't contribute to something, man gets pridefully angry and upset about that. This is the offense of the cross for prideful man. He just can't let go of control. It's a stumbling block. But salvation, listen, it is always by God's initiative. Whether we like it or not, in scripture confirms the judgment that awaits for anyone who would preach any other message. So, we understand the dangers of false teachers, the dangers of false teachers. Consider the consequences for false teachers, the consequences for false teachers. Verse 10, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. First notice a bit of encouragement. In the midst of the blasting, the Apostle Paul still has love in his heart. And the reason why he's writing the letter is because of his love for these Galatian believers. He's got a stern thing to say. He's got some, uh, a very definitive message. He's driving this message home, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't love them. And that doesn't mean that he doesn't want to see an about face from them. That's why he's writing. So notice this encouragement that, that Paul places right here. I have confidence in the Lord, <clears throat> in the Lord, <clears throat> that you will take no other view. What is he encouraged by? Number one, he is assured of their salvation. Paul led them to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Paul believes and is confident that they know the truth. He is confident by their profession that they are believers in Jesus Christ. And he also affirms his confidence in their ability to return to that truth that the Judaizers have detoured them from as they bounced off of their running lane. Now this is 
a promise from God. And that's this, that the Lord is faithful to preserve and protect his own from falling headlong into the snare of heresy. Listen to Jude 24. It's just one chapter. Jude 24. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory and with great joy. Did you catch that phrase? Him who is able to keep you from stumbling. That's encouragement. That should be encouragement to all of us. Jude was addressing false teachers. And he's saying to him, that's God, who is able to keep you from stumbling, who is able to put you back on that pathway. God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you as blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And that is the hope of the believer, which is our future glorification. This is very much an encouragement to these people who are experiencing the blasting at the same time from the Apostle Paul. Number two, Paul turns his attention to the false teachers who are wreaking havoc among the Galatians. So a little bit of encouragement for Galatian believers. Now he turns his attention to the false teachers and he says, notice, notice his specificity here. He says, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Paul is convinced that some one or several false teachers are to blame. These, of course, all the, are the false teaching Judaizers. Notice number three, the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty. So we have encouragement, and we have also the identification, and number three, we have, um, we have also the affirmation of penalty, of consequence. So just as Paul is confident in the Lord that Galatian believers, genuine believers, will not desert Christ, he is also confident that the one or the ones who are troubling them will be judged. So we understand from verse 10 that there are definite consequences for false teachers. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. You can go ahead and turn there if you like. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. That's, this, of course, is speaking of false teachers. Listen, here's the message. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. Peter is saying, the Lord takes notice of those who are a hindrance. And he doesn't take notice because he's surprised, but he already knew. You see, that's one of the attributes of Almighty God is that he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. The truth is, here's the truth, that there are consequences for false teaching. False teachers will incur judgment. All of us will stand before God, and all of us will be giving an account, and false teachers included, especially. For false teachers, they will incur judgment, eternal and devastating punishment, if they persist without repentance. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, Jesus was setting that statement up in verses 1 through 5 of Matthew chapter 18 because Jesus had been describing the childlike faith and the humility that is required for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And he's speaking about young believers, that if anyone diverts these young believers off of their path, it would be better for you because you'll have blood on your hands if a huge millstone that was used for grinding grain and was pulled by donkeys, if that were fastened around your neck and thrown into a deep sea. It'd be better for you if that happened. So, does Paul mean to communicate a very serious message? You betcha. Is, is Paul very serious about protecting the integrity of God's word? You betcha. 
Is there anything more important to Paul than, than protecting God's word and ensuring that that message is not adulterated? That's Paul's point. That's what he believes, and that needs to be our position. That needs to be our understanding. We need to own that, just as Paul did. And here in verse 6, he warns that a harsh judgment will come on those who cause one of these little ones who believe in him, little in their faith, to sin or to stumble. This would include falling away from faith in and commitment to Jesus Christ. It's a horrifying warning against leading people astray through false teaching, through an inconsistent example, or through a, an inconsistent testimony. So we understand the dangers that false teachers pose. And we know that there will be consequences for false teachers. But the question now is, how do we guard against it? I've already alluded to it. We've got to know the word first and foremost. And I'm going to get to that because I have three sub points. We've got to know the word. How do we protect against false teachers? Well, you've got to be on alert. This is not a passive stance. This is an active stance. You're actively guarding against it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Think about this and frame it in this present age. Think about this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Scripture teaches that we should actively guard against false teachers in three ways. Number one, commit to the word. Number one, commit to the word. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. This is Paul, of course, speaking to his to his disciple Timothy. And he's encouraging Pastor Timothy in this way. He says, persist in this, for by doing, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So why? Why does he say keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching? Well, he's saying give attention to personal study of God's word. Give attention to personal study of God's word. Only through careful study can we discern between truth and error. Is our example of diving into God's word, is our example of seeking out opportunity to be instructed by the word, maybe in small Bible study, is our, is our life framed around knowing and doing the will of God, which can only be discerned by diving into his word? That's the question here. Give attention, not only to the personal study of God's word, carve out for yourself time. You are not going to be able to know God's word if you don't make it a priority to study, to show yourself approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're welcome, Commander. So for all of these kids that attend Awana, they know that verse. And that verse isn't intended just for kids who attend Awana. But for all believers in Jesus Christ, study the word, know it, make a habit, make a joy out of personal Bible study. It's the only way you're going to grow in him. Also, give attention to the proclamation of the word, whether in preaching or in teaching. And it doesn't just have to be me who stands here in front of this microphone. But if you can discern truth from error, find others who are like-minded, that you can listen to, that you can be instructed by. It's incredibly important that our teaching be sound about God's word, whether in private or in public. For those that teach, ask yourself a question. Is what I'm teaching instructive? Does it encourage personal reflection? Is it edifying, and is it consistent with the truth in God's word? Does our teaching point others to God? Does our teaching help them to draw closer to God? 
Everything that we do here within this assembly should be framed around that desire to know God's word, to be able to apply it to our lives, and to encourage and to edify others in that same way. So, number one, commit to the word. Number two, avoid false teaching. Of course, the only way you can avoid false teachers is if you can identify the teaching that is false, which is predicated upon knowing the truth to begin with. So you can see that the two here are inextricably linked. You've got to commit to the word and know it so that you can avo avoid the false teachers when you hear it. You follow? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Avoid false teachers. This is the message. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Listen. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is not a message of hocus pocus witchcraft. This is a message right here of test the spirit, small s. Test the message that's being propagated by the messenger. In other words, be discerning. Listen, compare it to God's truth that you should know to determine whether or not it's truth or error. 2 John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, listen, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. For people will be lovers of self. Listen, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. To avoid false teachers, you have to know who they are. You can't avoid somebody if you don't know who they are. And you also have to know the Lord's word before you can determine whether they are teaching falsely and need to be avoided. It's very simple. It's really quite simple and how complicated we make this. So commit to the word, love it, study it, ask God to help you comprehend it, and then discern the truth from the error. Avoid the error that is taught. And Paul also tells us to rebuke false teachers. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 19 to 20. Now this is Paul, of course, writing to Timothy, and it's regarding elders. And he says, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, and the, um, the frame here is persist in sin of, of not teaching sound doctrine, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Paul is speaking, like I said, of elders who persist in error. It could be the sin of teaching false doctrine, or it could be the sin of evil behavior, but certainly teaching false doctrine is on the level of false behavior because the common word there is false. And we need to be protectors and advancers of truth. And this admonition applies not just to elders, but anyone who would teach the word of God in any context. Paul says, anyone, any elder who does not accept correction, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. We may need to call false teachers out by name. Paul did that. He named six of them. You don't have to go there, but you might want to jot these down. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. He spoke of who at one time had been a partner of his in ministry. His name was Demas. And he says, uh, Demas, he was in love with this world. Demas, who is in love with this world. 
2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Phygelus and Hermogenes. He says, they turned away from me, along with everyone else in a province of Asia Minor. They turned away from me, from Paul. That's what he said. So we're up to three. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. Paul says, and Alexander, I handed him over to Satan to learn not to blaspheme. That's what Paul was doing. Paul, as a Pharisee, was blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. He was, he was guilty of the sin of blaspheme because he was rejecting the divine call. And, and, and Paul is saying, Alexander has been handed over to Satan, handed over to his sin to learn not to blaspheme. Perhaps God is going to do his work on him as he is removed from ministry because he's a danger. He's a hazard. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. We have Hymenaeus and Philetus who swerved from the truth, Paul said. They believed that the resurrection had already happened. What they were doing was preaching a message, teaching, and, and their message denied the believer's bodily resurrection that we believe is yet to come. So the bottom line is this. This is serious, serious sin. To not get the gospel right was unacceptable to Paul. And to not get the gospel right that's unacceptable to all of us in the 21st century, at least my hope is that we share that same view. There's nothing more important. There's, there's the preeminence of the word. I don't just say it. We really need to own it. We really need to believe it. The bottom line is that it's serious, serious sin. The mishandling of God's word is serious. So my question for you is, do you take the mishandling of the word of God seriously? To brush over it and say, bah, I mean, it's not that bad. No, it's bad. Paul is telling us it's bad, and it's that bad. So the question is, do you take the mishandling of the word of God seriously? Are you able to detect false teaching when it presents itself? Or is your time in God's word so shallow that you don't really get to those deep and enduring understandings of those truths to be able to have something to measure error against, which is the truth. See, we have to not just have a surface understanding of, of uh, elementary Sunday school truth. We need to have a deep understanding of the gospel truth. The only way we can possibly detect error is if we ourselves know the word. So we need to be able to discern the truth from the error so that we can avoid the error and for those who persist in the error, Paul says, rebuke them. For those that continue to persist, he says, name them. But Paul said, to summarize, we must protect the flock and expose false teachers to minimize, as he put it in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17, he said to minimize the gangrene. Now, obviously, we know uh, he, he uses the illustration of running a race, he uses the illustration of baking and the impact of yeast or leaven, and he uses the illustration of a disastrous infection that usually requires the amputation of a leg or some other body part in order to stop the spread of the infection. This is the language that Paul uses concerning false teaching. We have to know the truth. Paul's words in, in verse 12, and we'll begin to, we'll close here for today. Verse 12, we've kind of left that hanging there, but let's conclude with this. He says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. The Greek word translated emasculate was often used of castration. Ironically, here's the irony in this statement. Paul doesn't get any more definitive or stern than with this statement in verse 12. Since the Judaizers were so insistent on circumcision as a means of being justified or pleasing God, Paul says, why stop at circumcision? Just go ahead and take the whole thing off. Go all the way and demonstrate your devotion to God. Now, you have to understand the context. There were area cults. And the priests of these cults, in order to demonstrate their extreme devotion to God, did just that. They were self-made eunuchs. 
Could you imagine that? They mutilated themselves because they thought that they were garnering for themselves a right standing before God. And these Galatian believers that Paul is writing to, and he knows that in the reading of this letter that there would be the false teachers who hear this, that's his message. It all boils down to the running of that race. Paul started. Paul started in verse 7. You were running well. You were running well. Listen, as believers in Jesus Christ, our race begins at salvation. That's where the race begins. Now, at salvation, we then are put on a pathway and that's the race that we run. And how we progress on that pathway, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. When you're diverted off of the pathway, especially given the skill of most runners in a, in a race that involves running, any diversion off of that pathway means that you are going to not win that race. Now the good news is, is that this doesn't take into account the grace of God which can put us back on our right pathway and still allow us to win the race. How are you running the race is the question. How are you running the race? The race that we run, the quality of our running, is linked to obedient living. And as we obey, we invite the Spirit's work of God in our lives. This is the process of sanctification. And it is in this posture that we can know God's will for our life. You see, salvation, a love of God's word, obedient living, pathway, running lane. We could really capture it with one simple statement, and that's our big idea. So, sorry kids, and I made you wait until the very end of this thing, until we could really capture what I want us to capture, and that's this, that we should run life's race wanting to fulfill God's will. Yes, the universal Sunday school response. It's got to be God or Jesus, and you got it. We should run life's race wanting to fulfill God's, word, God's will in our lives. I have a little message underneath the glass of my desk in my office. God's will is the believer's earthly heaven by A.W. Tozer. God's will is the believer's earthly heaven. Do you want to know God's will? Do you want to do God's will? Is that your objective in this life? To know and do God's will? Or is God's will an offense to you? Is it a stumbling block? Does God's will sometimes get in the way of your will? Do you desire to know God more and more? Are you studying his word to show yourself approved so that you can discern truth from error in order that he might be glorified? Do you love his truth enough to defend it? Do you love his truth enough to protect it? Do you love his truth enough to proclaim it? If you're truly saved, the race has already started. How you do on the track will determine how well you finish the race. Run well so that you may finish well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time that we've been able to gather around your word for instruction, and I just pray that you, Father, would give us an intense desire to know your word, to be able to discern the truth from the error, so that we can then have a clear vision of what your will is for our life, so that our deepest desire, which should be as believers in Jesus Christ, to know your will, so that we can then do your will, because that's the best that we can hope for in this life that we live on this fallen earth. Father, I just pray that you would continue to remind us of these truths, that it would be our desire to, to uh, know you and to know your word so that we can detect truth from error.
I just pray, Father, that this body of believers would share a common concern, which is to protect the integrity of what you have provided to us, uh, which is your word. Be with us now as we respond in song. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to do so. May you be honored and glorified, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.